Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Transport, Works and Water Resources, the Honorable Romel Springer, the Honorable Edmund Hinkson, Member of Parliament for St. James North, Board of Directors, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I take this opportunity to be the first to welcome you to Vespera Gardens for the opening of our first two show houses under the Hope Project. Here at Vespera, we'll be constructing 152 houses in two phases. Phase one will comprise of 90 houses made up of 49 two-bedroom houses and 41 three-bedroom houses. Phase two will comprise of 62 houses made up of 29 two-bedroom houses and 33 three-bedroom houses. Here with us today, we have 30 approved applicants to give them a glimpse of what their future homes would look like. Our homes are completed with tiles, built-in closets and kitchen cupboards with a quartz countertop. Through a partnership with Unicomer Barbados, we were also able to place furniture within the show houses for our walkthroughs over the next few weeks. Hope continues to receive applications daily from aspiring homeowners. We, are, we currently have a total of 2,971 applicants. We stand here today at our first site, Vespara Gardens, with construction scheduled to begin at our Pool St. John and Colleton St. Lucie developments within the next few months. Before I close, I wish to thank the contractors, architects, architects cube, our engineers, Mayhe Ridley Hazard, the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited, Capital Financial, the Insurance Corporation of Barbados Limited, and most importantly, the staff of Hope for making today possible. After this morning, persons may call our office at 538-8000 to schedule an appointment to visit our show houses. I welcome you once again, and I thank you for coming out today. I'll hand over to our chairman, Tony Hoyas, to deliver a few remarks. Thanks, Tamara, and welcome to everybody. Prime Minister, thank you for coming. And um, we are going to open the two. The Prime Minister has uh, agreed to open the two show units for us today, two two-bedroom units. And next month, we'll open a three-bedroom show unit. And there's a number of persons here who have qualified for loans. Uh, and we've invited them to come and, and take a sneak peek. From here on out, every Saturday, we will have show units open to the public. As Tamara says, this is 100 and approximately 155 units we want to build here. Although we are contemplating, we are actually in the design phase now of bringing in some sh townhouses uh, because those will add to the, and allow us to increase the density of the area and they also meet a different, um, they, it's a, it expands the offering. Some people like the idea of a townhouse, slightly bigger, with living dining downstairs and bedrooms upstairs. When we finish this, we, actually not when we finish, we've already started clearing land at Pool in St. John, where we have a proposal for 201 residences. That infrastructure work has started two weeks ago. We should start building in St. John at the junction between Four Roads and the St. John Woods at the uh, edge of uh, pool plantation, where it borders onto the road, and we're gonna build 201 residences there. Starting, those residences will start in September this year after the road works are put in. We also hope to be able, be able to start Colleton in St. Lucie at um, about 85 residences. That infrastructure work, we hope, will start in the near future, and then about four months later, we can start building houses. We also have plans in the works for several hundreds of houses at Searles in Christchurch and at Vineyard in St. Philip. And we are now preparing the paper for government to approve the acquisition of the necessary lands and there are some other government lands that will be made available to us. Our intention, our, our, our ambition is to build 1,000 of these houses per year for the next five years, which will give us 5,000 houses out of the government's stated program of building 10,000 houses in five years. 
and the, the rest of the houses will be built by the other um, arms of uh, government, NHC, and Ministry of Housing, Lands, and Maintenance. Uh, I don't think um, that is our a summary of where we're at today. I thank the people that, who we invited for coming out and taking a look at the, uh, the houses. I know you all are excited about what you all have seen. I think that's been a, a universal uh, feedback I've had in the hour since we've been here. Um, I'm sure the Prime Minister would like to hear your views on it. If you are so inclined, you can get a minute of her time afterwards. I'm going to ask the Prime Minister to speak now to say a few words about the policy because this policy really was started. I was introduced to it in February 2020. I was asked to come to a meeting of the government's economic um, council uh, down in Bay Street. And they said, we want to build, and this is what we want to do. We want to build houses that can be sold at the same amount of monthly payment as they're paying in rent, which was somewhere between 800 around 800 for a two-bedroom house and $1,000 for a three-bedroom house. And, um, and the Prime Minister later told me, reduce the transaction costs, the legal fees, the valuation fees. So our prices that we've managed to achieve in this uh, government entity called Hope Inc., for a two-bedroom house fully finished, is $172,000, $172,000. That includes your legal fees, and it is fully furnished. There are several developments that claim to uh, be providing affordable income houses um, done by the private sector, and they're fine-looking houses, but generally, in many cases, they're not complete. They don't have tiles on the floor, they don't have cabinetry, in it and a cabinetry, and they don't have hot water systems. We have all three. Our houses are move-in ready. $172,000 for an 803-square-foot two-bedroom house and $220,000, again, legal fees included, for a 1,037-square-foot three-bedroom house, fully finished. I think it is an excellent policy that the government came up with, and we are pleased and proud that we are playing our part in executing it. Um, we've worked through COVID, we've worked through the various shutdowns, we've worked through delays in the international supply uh, chain to us. We've set it up, we have our warehouses in operation, we are now ready and primed to scale our operations to deliver a thousand houses a year. I'm going to ask the Prime Minister to say a couple of words and then to please come and open up our, our show units and then we will have the press, the press come in afterwards and take your pictures. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. I have the message immediately to keep the speech short with the number of parasols that are out there and I shall not disappoint. Um, you don't have to speak a long time when the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the proof of this government's policy is this morning self-evident for all. We have, as you heard, determined that it was critical for us to enter into the housing market and to satisfy a serious demand for housing in this country that regrettably has been there for way too long. It became evident that we needed to reduce the cost of land reduce the cost of construction, reduce the cost of transactions, reduce the cost of accessing the mortgage and make it more affordable. And how have we done it? We've tried to be able to cap the land price to you with respect to how much you are paying for the land. In my constituency, people were paying $25 a square foot for land and having to dig down deep, deep, deep to find foundation. And I felt it was wrong because when you match that against the ability of a nurse to pay, a policeman to pay, a teacher to pay, you're then asking people to literally have to find a second job to be able to live, and the quality of life is therefore compromised. Secondly, we felt strongly that we needed to be able to allow you to afford the mortgage in a more, in an easier way if possible. And it just so happened that the expansion of renewable energy that is necessary for us to fight the climate crisis is upon us. And it means, therefore, that while you earn during the day or night in your job, this house is earning for you every day 
as well. And by reason of that, you're being able to afford the house at a cheaper price than you might otherwise have paid had we not used the home ownership providing energy model in this respect. And this is the magic of government using a cloud with a silver lining to make all the difference for you. Ironically, we're going to have to do the same thing with the sugar factory sugar and, and, and the sugar industry because renewable energy is going to create those opportunities for us to be able to empower Barbadians, enfranchise Barbadians, but also to stabilize critical sectors in this economy like the sugar industry. So where are we today? This is but one of the mechanisms towards the 10,000 houses that we have spoken about. And as you know, we are also creating opportunities for small contractors here. I think Mr. Hoyas and them will tell you that there are people who have been allocated two houses, five houses, 10 houses, depending on their capacity. And the market, we will have more than enough houses to build for serious contractors to be able to comply and to participate. Similarly, in my budget speech um, in March, I made it clear that we are not going to go through for persons who are with existing houses a lengthy and difficult application process for you to also benefit from being able to use your roof um, to be able to provide energy or whether it is small wind turbines because in some instances some houses don't really have the capacity to take the photovoltaic panels, some chattel houses. So believe you me, we are actually having a colloquium shortly that will allow us to settle the policy framework for the legislation, and that will allow us to refine what size houses have automatic allocation at 2.5 kilowatts, 5 kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, but without prejudice to the fact that even though that is what you are allocated by law, you have the right to apply for variation if you so want, and you can make the case for it. That is but one aspect of it. But we also are going to create opportunities for investment and savings. And why? You put your money in the bank, and how much are you getting now in savings and in interest rate? 0.05%. And I showed in the budget some figures showing that you will get 40 times more if you put that same money in a green bond. And a green bond is simply an instrument that will help finance the construction of renewable energy plants, so photovoltaic plants or wind energy plants, and you will get back up 4%. Similarly, if you decide that you don't want to invest it as debt, but you have a little more patience and you prefer to get a higher return, you can invest it as equity. Now, as we all know, with equity, you only get money back if the company makes a profit. But the truth is that because renewable energy is going to have to be so critical to supplying electricity for us instead of fossil fuels, the chances are very good with respect to the rate of return, which is why everybody is running for it. My own perspective is that we will not have enough savings in Barbados in any event on our own to finance the transition that has to be financed between now and 2030. And that even with all of the savings that we have, we're still going to need regional and international capital to help us do the transition. I haven't spoken about the battery um, investments as well because, as you know, unless we have batteries, these panels will just dissipate the energy that it, it, that it generates. And what you want is for the energy to be stored and then transferred to the grid in a way that makes it efficient for us to use it. So I'm not going to cause you to be the recipient of energy anymore by standing in the sun. Suffice it to say that this is the beginning of the silent revolution in housing in Barbados. And to the nurses, and to the teachers, and to the police, and to the admin officers, and to the others, whether you are gas station workers, whether you work in supermarkets, at whatever level, if you're senior and uh, upper middle income, there's something for you in the whole project too. We have set it at three different levels to be able to meet the needs of all income brackets and to be able to make it easier for you to own it. And why? At 19 years old, I was a student in London paying rent. And I learned then 
that rent is dead money. From the time the money leaves your pocket, it is dead. You take that same money and you spend it in a mortgage, you're getting back equity, you can go back and borrow on the asset, go back and borrow on the house five years, 10 years, 12 years from now, you need some money for education, you need some money for another investment, you need some money for business, you need some money for healthcare, it is yours. Why would you take the same money and put it in rent? And I end on this point because that is a point that Mr. Hoyas engaged us in February 2020. We do not want people paying R-E-N-T as far as possible in this home ownership democracy. And if we are going to make sure that it happens, then we need to create the environment which is what we've done. So my friends, let this be just the appetizer to what is to come in this silent revolution. Thank you and God bless you. And the police, you can't have a person at $800 a month, $2,000 a month, buying land at $20 a square foot. Exactly. But then nothing left to fill that. Right. The other reason we're doing this is that there must be a standard, mm -hmm. yes. a minimum standard for home right in this country. Yeah.